If you have some kind of a gear addiction, you're on the right channel. Today we have a cool guitar, which we're gonna be reviewing. It's really cool because it's over 40 years old. So I'm really excited to be taking a look at this guitar. We're gonna take a deep dive into it in a few moments. Now, first I wanna say thank you to all my subscribers. We've hit and surpassed the 25,000 subscriber mark. So thank you to each and every one of you that has taken the time to subscribe to the channel. If you're still not subscribed, guys, ask yourself why <laughs> hit the little subscribe button so you won't be missing out on the great content because we got a lot of cool stuff for gear addicted people just like you so without further ado let's get to the topic at hand today i have a really cool guitar it's right here just off of camera view but i just want to start off by saying that this special guitar was actually made in 1978. So that makes it what, 44, 44 years old if my math is correct. 1978, I was nine years old. So that means I was probably still playing with my race car track set or something like that back then. So I wanna just give you an idea of what was going on back in 1978, just in case you're younger than I am and you don't really know what was going on, okay? So 1978 means Van Halen 1 came out. The first Van Halen album, the debut album, self-titled Van Halen, uh, which basically went off like a bomb. Everybody that played guitar at that time was shocked by what Eddie Van Halen was doing on guitar and it changed the, the scene, the music scene forever. We're still today trying to recover from that album. One of my favorite albums of all time, right? Van Halen 1 was coming out. Now, not everything back then was heavy. Um, Saturday Night Fever, the movie came out with John Travolta and he was changing what people were doing on the dance floor back then. Music like disco was still very popular. Bee Gees were very hot, especially after that movie. Uh, bands like Tears for Fears were coming out on the scene back in 1978. It's hard to believe since I still listen to them today. I think their albums uh, are great. We have bands like The Eagles that came out with Hotel California, an iconic album that is, you know, uh, just a classic rock album. He lost Keith Moon, the, the crazy drummer from The Who. Uh, he died of an overdose. Hard to replace a guy like him. Uh, but that's what comes with the territory sometimes when you're living the rock and roll lifestyle. So that was basically, in a nutshell, what was happening back then. The guitar that I'm going to show you right now was also happening back then because that's when this guitar was created. So this guitar is a wonderful specimen because of its age. This is a Gibson Les Paul Custom uh, built in 1978, September of 1978. Well, at least the pickups were built in September 1978. This guitar was built around that time too. I'm really happy to have the opportunity to take a look at this guitar. Thanks to a very dear friend of mine who owns this guitar. Unfortunately, I do not own this guitar. I'd love to own it, but I don't. Um, and he is a proud owner of this guitar. And he passed it to me because he wanted to return this guitar back to stock because it has been modified. The original pickups were removed and uh, my buddy put in a set of, uh, I think they're DiMarzios. I'm not really sure actually. I haven't actually taken them out to take a look. Regardless, we're gonna be replacing these pickups and putting in the original stock pickups back in the guitar. Now, I don't really know what the stock pickups are. I've taken them out and I'll share a picture of the backside of these pickups with you. If any of you out there know what these pickups are, please let me know. I have a feeling they're T-tops, but I'm not 100% certain on that. So if you are an owner of one of these guitars and you have more information than I do, please, Give me a comment and let me know what they are because otherwise I'm not 100% certain. I'm leaning towards T-tops. I'd like that to be confirmed if possible. We're gonna be returning this guitar back to stock, which means I'm gonna be taking out the 
more modern pickups, putting in the original pickups, and then we'll be doing a follow-up video where I'll be recording a sound sample of both of those pickups, the original pickups that were supposed to be in this guitar, as well as the pickups that are in there now, and you'll be able to hear side-by-side side an A-B comparison of both sets of pickups and let me know which ones sound better. So we're not gonna be doing a sound sample in this video, we're gonna save it for that one. I think it's gonna be pretty Pretty cool and I might even throw in a wild card in there just to make things even more spicy and I'll get to that at the end of the video. Alright so let's take a look at what this guitar is all about. The Les Paul Custom actually came out after the Les Paul. It was released a few years after the Les Paul and it was actually meant to be a higher end guitar. They chose to go with gold hardware and um, ebony fretboard and just the binding all around the headstock and whatnot uh, it made it a very sexy looking guitar it's often uh, been referred to as a tuxedo guitar because of the black and white you know that you have around the edges and the trim because it is double bound uh, the guitar definitely looks hot one of the things I really like about this guitar is that no matter what kind of style of music you're playing, whether it's hard rock, whether you're playing in sort of a very sophisticated band or ensemble, it, it fits almost everywhere. It just looks the part no matter what you're trying to do. And looks awesome, I gotta say. Now for a uh, 40 plus year old guitar, it is a great example of how nicely these guitars can age. There's no ugly checking, there's no unsightly buckle rash where the paint is peeling off in the back. There is a little bit of buckle rash. You can probably see it if I catch the light just right, but it's not excessive. There's no major paint missing on this guitar but it has aged really, really well. One of the things that you'll notice on these older guitars is the fact that the gold hardware does um, sort of wear a little bit prematurely. Mind you, the age of the guitar uh, justifies the wear, but the gold hardware always ages quicker. It just does. The sweat on the palm of your hands rubbing against the gold just makes it um, patina a little bit quicker. Uh, as you can see on this one, the gold finish coming off on the posts. You do have some pitting uh, in the uh, metal for the stop tail and the bridge, but that's normal for gold hardware. I've seen that many, many times, even on more modern guitars with less mileage on them have the same problem when it comes to gold. That's just the way it is. These pickups were replaced and because they were replaced, um, gold covers were put on these pickups. The pickups were not originally covered. They were uncovered pickups, but it didn't look right. So my buddy uh, put on some uh, pickup covers. These covers have not been soldered in place. So they're actually just popped in there. So. If I press down on the pickup cover, you'll see that it's it actually, you know, moves. Um, and you can also see that the pickup covers don't really match the pickups. Uh, the pull pieces are not matched very well. So we're gonna fix all that when we put the old pickups back in. I have measured the output on them and the neck pickup is about 7.3, 7.4K. The bridge pickup is about 12.7K, quite a bit hotter. The original pickups that we're gonna be putting back in are about 7.5, both the neck and the bridge. So more like vintage type output. So I'm very curious to see what kind of sounds we're gonna be getting out of those, okay? But I have a feeling they're gonna sound great. This pickup uh, configuration is not out of the ordinary for what was being put out at the time with Gibsons. They have gone through a few different types of pickups before 1978 and after 1978. So that's why I'm kind of asking some help on identifying these pickups. So if you take a look at them, you'll see the pickups do have a date stamp on them and they do have a patent number on them. So if you guys know what that represents in terms of model, 
please let me know. So one of the cool things about this guitar is definitely the fact that it has an ebony fretboard. There's just something sexy about a really dark ebony fretboard. Um, and this one is beautiful, I have to say. Now, the inlays are typical block inlays that we see on a lot of guitars. Uh, they're not the trapezoid like you would see on Les Paul. So it is slightly different, very nice. The binding on this is typical where the nibs do go over the frets on the guitar. Many times these guitars have been referred to as fretless wonders. Why do they call them that? Because um, in certain models the frets were very wide and very low which made them feel almost like they didn't have any frets. That's why they would call them fretless wonders. Now this guitar, because it has so much mileage on it, I'm not really sure if the frets are low because of that and just maybe it's about ready for a fret job or if that's the way they originally were. I have a feeling it's a little bit of both, uh, but it still plays really well no issues with the fretboard and it's very, very comfortable. I was amazed to see how uh, the neck was so um, thin back to front. It really is one of the thinnest Les Pauls that I've tried. Um, I was actually shocked. I was, I was expecting a much more beefy neck and it's not beefy at all. So it really plays extremely well. It's very comfortable to play. That being said, the weight of the guitar, on the other hand, <laughs> make it feel like a boat anchor, okay? This is probably the heaviest Les Paul guitar that I've held in my hands. I put it on the scale, it came out at 10 pounds, 10 ounces, almost 11 pounds, where most guitars are around nine, nine and a half pounds. This one is hitting almost 11 pounds quite a bit more. If you're going to be playing this guitar standing up for a few hours, you're definitely going to have to go see a chiropractor eventually. So uh, you might want to find a good one in your area if you're planning on buying one of these guitars. These guitars were not uh, weight relieved. And in those days, I think a lot of guitarists felt that if a guitar is heavy, it just means it's got more, you know, more tone, more tone sounds better. Um, I can't vouch for how much better the tone is if the guitar is heavy. Uh, I don't want to get into that debate, but it definitely weighs a ton. So if you're suffering with back issues, you might want to skip over this model and go with something else. Just putting that out there. But other than that, it's a killer looking guitar. Now it's double bound and the binding after so many years has turned a beautiful cream color. Uh, I'm sure you can see that on your screen here. Uh, the areas of course where it's been rubbed while playing uh, still has more of a white tinge to it. You can see on the fretboard, on the side of the fretboard here, um, because it's been uh, played over and over, you can see where it has more of a white where the actual lacquer has been kind of slowly uh, eroded. That just gives it so much mojo. I love that in a guitar. It just makes it look so nice. Um, you can see also on the side of the fretboard here, you can see where the uh, black paint has so slowly been stripped away because, you know, somebody that's wearing a, a, uh, a ring would be playing the guitar here and you can see how it's worn off a lot of the paint right there. Uh, and on the opposite side, there's a few areas where the paint has also been worn off where, you know, your thumb hangs over the neck. Um, you know, it's not excessive wear. So a lot of these guitars that you see where they're re- uh, least the, they're making reissues and they're giving it a sort of a, a relic treatment. A lot of times it's overdone. Like they don't really look that worn. It takes a long time for a guitar to get worn like that. Um, this is very subtle. It's very nice. It just has the right amount of mojo. If we look at the headstock, the headstock on this guitar definitely is sexy. It's got the beautiful diamond inlays. It's got the Gibson uh, logo there. If you look at it close up, you will see that you know there, there is some cracking happening around the logo and the diamonds. Very normal for a guitar this age. You see that a lot. 
uh, even part of the inlays you can start to see small cracks showing up on the on the inlay trim again that's just what happens you know wear and tear um, climate um, things like that will happen uh, you can see some cracks happening along where the frets are that's very common uh, for guitars this age but again it just adds to the mojo in my in my uh, opinion I, you could feel different about it I love that look this guitar also has a little secret it, it actually is a second so if you look here underneath the serial number it's actually stamped second and there's no made in USA stamp so they weren't actually stamping these guitars with the USA um, letters yet in 1978 it came a little bit later so what does that mean if the guitar was stamped as a second does that mean it's a dud um, actually no it's very common to see some of these older guitars stamped as seconds. And what that basically means is that there was some sort of a blemish on the guitar. And unlike today where they just blemish or not, they just put it on the shelves and try to sell them uh, and hope you don't notice. In those days, they were actually marking them as seconds and I think they were actually selling them at a discount. Um, that doesn't necessarily mean the guitar is no good, far from it. In actual fact, I think some of the guitars you'll probably see today should be stamped as, a, as being a second because they're not all great, let's face it, uh, but they don't do that anymore. If you come across one of these older guitars and you see second stamped on it, don't worry, it's still a great guitar. Most of the time, those blemishes that were originally there you probably would not even be able to find them. And after, you know, 40 odd years, it doesn't really matter because the blemish will blend in with whatever else has happened on that guitar and it'll look right at home anyways. Out of curiosity, I also opened up the back plates here and I just wanted to take a look inside of the cavity to see what was what. And lo and behold, this cavity actually has a big metal or metallic cover that goes on top of it and looks like sort of an ash, ashtray cover, I'll call it that, that's held in place by two screws. And basically that is what they were using back in the day to create sort of a Faraday cage and basically shield the electronics of the guitar. Now I find that really cool something that we don't see anymore on guitars today and they didn't it didn't look like they were cutting corners at that time because you know it's extra money for sure to do something like that and um, I was actually surprised to see that in there I opened up the switch cavity here as well and there's also a cylindrical metallic metal piece that's inserted into there and the ground wire is actually soldered to that metallic uh, wall and I guess that's the same idea for the switch uh, allowing them to sort of uh, avoid hum or 60 cycle hum even though these are humbucker uh, pickups that's I guess the type of shielding that they were using back in the day now you don't really see that today anymore nowadays we use um, you know methods that are a little bit more economical but in, in the day that's basically what it was status quo so if you buy one of these guitars and you see that in there um, that's what it's supposed to look like so it's pretty authentic now as far as the knobs and controls go it's pretty much standard two tones two volume knobs no uh, fancy switching or anything like that very straightforward and fun fact this guitar was created after the Norlin era right so for those of you who know what that means um, during the Norlin years the guitars were considered to be not as good, uh, probably not as well made as they were after that period. So this guitar falls into the period right after the Norlin era. So it's considered to be a good one. I don't know how much of a difference that actually makes, but just a fun fact I wanted to throw out there for you guys. Now, if you're interested in getting one of these guitars, you have a couple of choices. You can either go with a reissue because Gibson has reissued these guitars, um, or you can maybe hunt on eBay or Reverb or some other sites where they're actually selling the originals. 
If it was up to me and I could afford it, I would definitely go for the original because you're actually getting, um, you know, a timepiece. Whereas the reissues look the part, but I just don't feel like they're gonna have the same amount of mojo. So it's really up to you. The cost on these guitars nowadays will range between $8,000 and I've seen them as high as $12,000 depending on the condition and the age. Um, you know, this kind of condition I would say is very good for the age. I've seen a lot of other guitars that are selling for more that are not necessarily in, in very good condition. You can see there's a lot of checking going on. There's a lot more issues with the guitars. So you definitely want to take a good look at the guitar before you drop that kind of money. Um, I wanted to open up the truss rod here just to show you um, what that looks like, but unfortunately, it looks like somebody before me kind of um, uh, stripped the screws and I didn't want to mess around with it too much, so I'll leave that for another time. Uh, I did want to give you a close-up shot of the uh, nut on this guitar. You can see how low it is. It's actually just slightly higher than the first fret. So it's really interesting to see that because the, the more modern guitars definitely have a larger nut on them. Um, other than that, the back of the headstock looks really cool. Tulip style uh, tuners. Now it's funny that the tuners um, looks like they've uh, withstood um, the wear and tear a lot better. They're, they're, they're not as uh, worn in terms of the finish. Uh, on the actual uh, knobs. It's funny because the knobs still look like they're pretty nice and shiny, but the back of the uh, the tuners look a little bit more um, matte in color for some reason. I don't know why, but it's, it, it is what it is. A really nice guitar. I can vouch for how nicely it plays. Um, definitely would be a beautiful guitar to add to any collection. If you can find one of these, you definitely want to snag it up if you have the budget for it. I think you will be happy to own one of these guitars and they're just going to keep on going up in value. So as a second part to this video, I will be doing a shootout uh, with these pickups and the original pickups, as I mentioned. I'll probably also give you some uh, gut shots of the cavities as I do the pickup upgrade and will definitely be able to provide you with an AB sound clip so you can hear the same thing being played on the guitar one after another so you can actually hear the difference a little more. I think it would be pretty cool if we can take the guitar, do the sound samples as I mentioned, and perhaps throw in a wild card. The wild card that I'm talking about is this guitar, which is basically a copy of that guitar. Can you tell the difference? Which one is which? Well, this is the original Gibson. Um, and this is my Tokai, uh, which is basically a knockoff or a replica of this guitar. Very similar guitars. So I thought, why not throw in a wild card when we do the sound sample and not only check out what, what pickups sound like in this guitar, but once that's done, perhaps we can play it against this guitar and see how much of a difference there really is uh, between a guitar that potentially will cost 8,000 bucks and another guitar that nowadays probably sells for about 1,200 or something like that. Just out of curiosity, very similar guitars, similar but not the same. All right, guys, that's it for today. If you have any comments or questions about this video, leave them in the box down below the video. Um, if you have any questions about either one of these guitars, don't hesitate. I'll be happy to answer your questions. And if you'd like to provide information, maybe we missed something, leave your comments down below. I'm always happy to get your comments and feedback. In the meantime, guys, I want you to stay tuned and keep rocking. There'll be more great video and guitar reviews right here on Addicted to Gear.